Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 438 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today on the show, we are revisiting two interviews that feature Julia Galloway. She was recently named the 2023 Ceramic Artist of the Year by Ceramics Monthly and Pottery Making Illustrated. She's also one of my favorite artists, so I thought this was a good chance to go back into the archive and listen to some of her thoughts on both her career and trends that are happening in ceramics. First, we're going to have an excerpt from a 2013 interview where we discuss the development of new ideas in her work. Then we have an excerpt from a 2014 panel discussion with Michael Klein, Kristen Kiefer, and Julia. If you're interested in finding out more, you can visit her website. That's juliagalloway.com. Also wanted to take a minute and thank the folks that have donated to our podcast We are listener-supported, so I couldn't do it without the generous contributions of folks like Fiona Wheelband, Joseph Travis, and Stacey Loftus. If you're interested in making a contribution yourself, you can get involved at the website. That's talesofaredclayrambler.com slash donate. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. You have had many bodies of work. Mm-hmm. Um, some of them have been very similar in terms of color, in terms of line quality or whatever, mm-hmm. but they're still distinct. Mm-hmm. So like, let's say the Audubon um, work versus the um, earlier work where you were drawing the uh, European figures. Mm-hmm. So in your head, how do you distinguish cr- uh, crepuscule, I think? Oh, crepuscular. That, yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. How do you distinguish when a body of work starts in terms of when you're going to show Do you know what crepuscular it? means? I don't. When something's crepuscular. So crepuscular. Um, it's a funny word, crepuscular. Um, bears are crepuscular. It means you're most active in dawn and dusk. And so all those pots, ah. one side was dawn and one side was dusk. So, so it's about activity and rest. Yeah. Or just different times of the day. And then that pot holding your day. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. And so, well, let's talk about the European figures then. What was the connection there? Which ones you mean? The there European was figures. Uh, one was a woman, uh, the other was a man That's sitting. That's a Matisse painting. Ah, so you're, okay, you're referencing that within the work. Yeah, yeah. So there was a, so I had made, um, so I love that Matisse painting. And um, I love the tension between the two figures in the mm-hmm. painting. And so I had made, uh, I had projected the painting on the wall and I had put cups up. And I had drawn that part of the painting on those cups. Mm-hmm. And then flipped them around, so I had the painting in the morning and at night. And then when you pulled the cups apart, they became really abstract. Because you'd have, like, part of his shoulder or part of his, you know, because the projection was quite large. You know, it was maybe, I don't know, like, you know, like 8 feet by 12 feet or something. But probably what you saw was there's some vases and pictures that just had the painting on it. Because that helped the viewer understand the cups they were looking at. So how do you d- distinguish between bodies of work in terms of when you're ready to show it? You know, like when the idea comes to fruition and you're ready to put it out into the gallery world, mm-hmm. and then when you're done with that idea and you're going on mm-hmm. to the next thing. I kind of hate to say this, but I'm like a deadline girl. You know, yeah. like I just am. I'm a deadline girl. And um, it seems to me, I usually have two solo shows a year. And it seems to me that there's usually one in the spring and one in the fall kind of like that. And usually the one in the spring, the work's not really quite there, but it's getting really close. And in the fall, it's really developed and maybe is starting to get a little tired. So I feel like there's somewhere in there. Um, And then I think I just run through it and then I'm done. Like I, like at the end of the Audubon show, I just felt like this is it. This is, I'm done. I've done all the birds in North America and Mm -hmm. we're going to, 
you know, move on now. Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes there's changes in my life, like I left Rochester, so it wouldn't make sense to draw those pots anymore. Yeah. I mean, I could draw the houses of Missoula, but that seems really bizarre <laughs> to me, you know, because <laughs> that work was all about living in Rochester, right? So, um, like, I wouldn't make these cloud pots in, you know, I wouldn't make the cloud pots in New York. Mm. So I think often that's affected by location or, um, and usually there's like a, like for a long time I was like on a one year cycle. And then when I started teaching, it was a two year cycle. And now that I've been teaching and I'm working administratively, I'm on a four year cycle. Mm. So usually I work on an idea for almost four years. And see that for me is a natural pace about every four years I switch things. So I really admire that you can work through ideas so fast. I mean, to me, that seems... Well, you know, there's some, and I can't really figure out, Ben, if I can go back. Because there's, uh, you know, I made all these work, work with maps on them, mm-hmm. and I don't really quite feel done. Yeah. Like you want to get back into yeah, it? Yeah, but that was 10 years ago that I made those pots. And yeah. I don't know. I just, I make them for a different reason now. So I'm mm-hmm. trying to figure that out. I wanted to read something that you had written about the Audubon pots. Because um, I think this speaks a lot about who you are, actually. I know that sounds really presumptive of me. so I, I, maybe <laughs> Give it a we'll, shot there, buddy. <laughs> maybe take this back. Uh, I heard on national public radio that when James John James Audubon realized that he would not live long enough to paint all the birds in North America, he began to draw with both hands at the same time. I thought, oh, I understand this. I know what passion is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so let's talk about that because that, this concept of drawing with both hands or like being so creatively... Um, sort of stimulated that you can't get it out enough. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what that's like for you as a maker? Because I think that speaks to ambition. It speaks to dedication. It speaks to obsession. (laughs) It just feels like a push. It feels like like a wave or something. Like, like I got to do this thing, you know. Jill Overman, a dear friend of mine, We've shared studios off and on for many years, and she'd come and say, Jewel, six is enough. And I'd be like, no, no, no. I have this thing, and i got to have 12. You know, and I just knew it. Like, I just knew that it was 12. And I and I think there's something about that push. Like, I think there's a release in it, right? Or there's some kind of, um, like, that sense of satisfaction or the sheer exhaustion of things. Um, and I love being lost in something so large and uh but i think there's just like this internal i mean it's not a picnic you know that's like that's not a picnic right like you know like john james audubon that was seven kilns of bird cups that was three people wadding for 30 hours right you know so um just wadding right uh just think there's a a sense of like a push and does it feel anxious in those moments or does oh, it yeah, feel I th- oh yeah 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 i mean i think yeah yeah you know i think we gotta <laughs> like like you know when you're walking in the wind and you're walking and the wind is pushing behind you and you're like okay i'll hurry up it feels like that a little bit okay. like there's like some drive and i think that um i mean i think it could be you could say like you know, and bi- like all those words, I don't, I don't know about all those words. I just know that when I heard that about John James Audubon, I thought, I know you, I know you, I know about that kind of like obsession. Like I know you, you know, yeah. mm, I know you. You know, it's kind of like that old friend familiarity, or like it was like an accent, yeah. like it was like um, like a labor accent or something. And what a nice representation of that. In the same artist statement, you talked about how you had worked uh, really late in the night and you heard a bird go off, a bird chirp, um, and there was a light that had come on and it confused the bird thinking it was morning. Right. But for you, you thought, oh my God, I worked all night. Right, right. You know? And that, that that sort of like indulgence in work was what you related to with Audubon. And, right. and that's what kind of set you off on that. That direction is interesting to me because it's 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 a a metaphor – I think sometimes we have personal metaphors that really drive us that the viewer sometimes doesn't really need to know, yeah. but we really need to have them. Yeah. You know, like we got to have that engine pushing us along. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's a, an interesting reference. I think. 
Ben, I also just think like that's my world that I live in. Mm. You know, like I live in a world of many, and I learned through making a lot, and I learned from that bigness. Like there's a bigness that comes from thinking, I'll do all these birds. I want to I wanna look at every drawing. Like I want to look at every drawing. Like that's just the world I'm in, you know? And how do you approach that when you display in the gallery? Because I've seen a few of your um, installations that were using functional objects. But it was definitely when you saw all the objects together, there was a feeling that one cup couldn't give you. You know, there was right. this sense of grandiosity. And sometimes it was, you know, well, let's, can you talk about that? Oh, my God. Look, they're cups. You <laughs> drink from them. Nobody is like, like duh, right. you know. So there was never anything about like challenging function or, you know, it's never any of those things. But so like I have this whole life with this cup while I'm making it, right? Like we have this whole life together. We have like a story together and we're going through this thing and a group of us are going through it all together, right? And we have these cups and then they go to the gallery and the gallery is the shortest moment in the pot's life, right? It's like a flash. It's like a flash in their life, but it determines everything. So I just felt like Sometimes people really couldn't figure out the ideas in my pots. Like they'd be like nice bird. The idea was like, you know, like, like, uh, like, like Audubon, right. you know, it was like big, it was right. a big idea. Mm -hmm. So I felt like by putting all the pots together, it would help them get the bigger idea. And so putting up the work in a way that's installing the work in a way that supports the idea helps the person who's going to take that pot home. It gives them a leg up. You know, it gives them a leg up and it gives them a experience with that pot that helps begin their own story. And it's a, do you think of it as a trigger? You know, like yeah. that it triggers use in a different way or it triggers maybe the idea and then that encourages use down the line? I think trigger or, or maybe just like a seed. You know, it's like a trailer, right. you know, like go see this movie, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, so installing <laughs> them like that, right. you know, like installing all those cups to look like a bookcase, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, a, it's like a trailer, like. This has knowledge in it. I like the idea that there's labor in the pots and there's labor in the installation. Mm -hmm. So you walk in and there's that sense of like, like we were talking about seeing um, the terracotta warriors mm -hmm. and just feeling like, oh my God, like this is thousands of hours of labor. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me that it's, I don't know, it almost seems like you're honoring people that view it. You know, like you're building something that is going to honor them because you put all this effort, all this time, and then you're presenting it to the world. Um, it's almost like temples that decorate and decorate on top of decoration and on top of decoration to give that, that viewer the feeling of that, that space is important. Well, honor just sounds like I wish that was it because it sounds so good. Mm. But I think I just, like, I just want them to get it. I just want them to get a little bit of a clue. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like when you just want to do the best you can. Yeah. It's kind of that mm. a little bit hokey, I think. Mm. Like, I just want them to get a clue, mm. you know. So that they don't have to start from zero. And, and then they can figure it out a little bit more on their own. So that then they have a stronger story with that work mm -hmm. and also more confidence or more interest. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I don't really have to figure out the McDonald's cup anymore. I got yeah. that right away. Now, when you moved from RIT to, to Missoula, um, you you started making cloud forms, um, on the work. And the cloud is something that is, in the wrong use could be a, a visual cliche, you know, like it could be too plain. Mm -hmm. But the way you've handled that is so delicious, mm -hmm. like that drippy, runny glaze going over top of it, that when I see it, I never think, ah, oh, that's a visual cliche. Mm -hmm. So like that, it's, it's, it's even more powerful because of that running and the luster and, you know, all that stuff. So how, how did you pick a symbol? Like a symbol like that is way more accessible in culture. Everyone can understand that as a symbol as to where some of the previous work, the symbols, um, like some of the gates that you were putting on there are a little more abstract. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on that? Like accessibility in the symbols that you use? Well, I hate that I might be getting less abstract. That would be unfortunate. <laughs> no. Um, I, before I started doing the clouds, I was doing all these, um, arches, like from inside of churches right? All of those are temples or mosques that had to do with sacred space. And there seemed to be such a similar, I had such a similar physical reaction to walking into a place of worship as I did into um, living in Montana. 
And it just had to do with always being aware of the horizon and the skyline, that you're just always looking up. Mm-hmm. And that um, I had spent so much time in Rochester looking down because the East Coast is different. Right. And, um, or looking uh, more like at the city, right? Yeah. And then I moved out to this beautiful place and it was more about looking up. Some of it was just um, like where I was in my life and starting a new mm-hmm. chapter, mm-hmm. which is so much more about looking up. Mm-hmm. So I think that... Um, the, those early pots have arches and clouds together, mm-hmm. and then the arches looked so weak to me next to the clouds. Oh, and um, the clouds seemed to have a potency, and they seemed to have an emotion, emotive, emotional response. Um, There's sort of a sorrow to them that I thought was very beautiful in the way that things that are beautiful have a little, always feel a little bit sad, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And... Um, I don't know. I know there's a word for that, Han, something like that. I don't know if there's a word for it, but I don't know what it is. So um, I think that's where that came from. And then also, it's so simple to draw, like compared to a, you know, scissor-tailed flycatcher. It's so simple to draw that suddenly I could move around that much more, just do half the cloud, cloud with half runny glaze, half no glaze. You know, like somehow I could move through that idea very, very quickly. Also, like. When everybody gets it, it's kind of nice. Yeah. You know, like kind of a, the base roost is like a little socialist in me. Mm-hmm. Like I want everyone to get it. So I wanted to finish up talking about the field guide because that's something you've, oh, yeah. you've put a lot of work in. Um, so can you talk a little bit about why you started that and, and maybe what it is for the listeners that don't know? When I was at RIT, the seniors were graduating and one of the seniors came to me and said, I want to meet with the juniors and tell them what's coming up next year. And I thought that was great. I thought that was fantastic. So we went and he met with the juniors and he said, like, this is what you got to do. This is what you don't got to do. You know, and I thought, ah, that's like peer to peer. That's the best. Because I could say all that stuff to him and it wouldn't be as good. So that kind of got stuck in my noggin. And um, there's a guy named James Lobb. He's a wonderful student. And uh he was a great student, and I thought that was so thoughtful and so actually helpful. There's a lot of, like, sort of helpful things, but that was, like, really helpful. So that was sort of the root idea of the field guide, and I, I wanted to make a booklet of information that would help students when they left. Because you can't teach all of that professional practice stuff in school. A few things happen. One is the creativity falls out of the work when commodity comes in. And two, you don't have time. So it first started by, I made this very slender little book that had, like, uh, how to deal with your student loans, Mm -hmm. how to find residencies, how to get health insurance after you graduate, how to talk to your electrician. Like, the questions that I kept hearing from the alumni. You know, I thought, oh, they need to know these things. So it was like a skinny little book. And then we we, uh, added some interviews with... um, artists that the students were interested in and they would interview the artist and um, they would say, what did you do when you first left school? So I wanted to make, I made this booklet to help the students when they left and that was a graduation present. And um, and it was like maybe 80 pages or something. It was like a little book and I'd copy them and I couldn't get the Xerox right so there was always one page upside down. <laughs> it was like kind of endearing, you know. Sure. And that was like in 2006, I think. And then uh, somebody saw one and wanted one, so I made some extras. And then like everybody wanted one, and so then I started selling them for 20 bucks, $25. And I, so we started a scholarship fund with that. And then um, an RIT gave me uh, $1,000 to do some research. So I hired a grad student, Tim Clark. For a whole summer, maybe it was two thousand dollars. It was some money, and he just researched all these things because it was so much better to get a student's point of view, right? So that what makes the field guide good is that it's all from what the student the students' points of view. It's not me preaching at them. It's not you should do this, right? Yeah, these are your options. What do you think about this? So when I left RIT, I couldn't really make those books anymore because I felt like that had been this project there. And I was making a ton of them by the time I left. I was Xeroxing them all the time. So um, when I got to Montana after a few years, 
uh, people still wanted them. And so I thought I should make a website out of it so that I could update the information quickly. And because Google is not a curator in any way, and students don't really know get that. that. Yeah. So now it's a website and it's uh, expanded a lot. Um, a lot more like digital information and more international things. But it, it's a website to help people when they leave school, to help cushion that really awkward transition of being having ex- ex- everything accessible to you and being the big man to then kind of out in the middle of nowhere and be do, you know. And um, I'm pretty keen on it right now. And you've been, it seems like you've been doing a lot of work on it recently, you know, with lo- what did you relaunch the website or it's been in existence for a while, but it seems like lately I've been seeing more things about it. So I launched the website like a year ago, year and a half ago, the end of last summer. So it's a little over a year and a half ago. And, um, like I put a lot of energy into it then, and then it was quiet for a little bit. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I just started working on it. Well, I made a Facebook page for it because nobody could find it. Like nobody could find it. And so I thought, well, this is a problem. Mm-hmm. And then I started getting more feedback that way. Mm-hmm. So then it was a little easier to. And also, like I'm kind of into it. Well, I think it's something that you can champion as an individual, but it's greater than you also. Right. You know, like this is information. Right. You know? like, this is like goes a long way. Uh, and the more that it's out there, the more people hear about it. It will, you know, it's g- gaining momentum probably as we speak. Well, I also wanted it to be a way of getting somewhere else. Like, I don't want the site to be the destination. Okay. You know, so like under resources, it's just all these links to uh, better web pages. Mm-hmm. You know, like a Yumi Horier's links page is yeah. genius. It is genius. It's flat out genius. Mm-hmm. I wasn't going to copy that and put it on the field guide. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I think, why it kind of works. Mm-hmm. So, and I just added a section about how to um, like, why do you apply for grad school? Mm. And so I ask uh, two people who are in grad school, two people who are applying, mm. and two people who weren't applying yet to come to my house, and they all had dinner, and they just talked about it all night and took notes. And I made this really good dinner for them while well, I ordered out for them. <laughs> and um, and um, then we typed that up, and that ended up being that chapter. And it was really quite acute because it was from them. Yeah. It wasn't what I thought they should do. It was much better. So you can get to it through your website, which is juliagalloway.com. Yep. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Amico Brent. For the past 100 years, Amico Brent has been creating ceramic supplies for our community, ranging from underglazes to electric kilns, and they have no plans of slowing down. With over 3,000 products, Amico Brent's top priority is making sure that all of their customer needs are met. From the professional to the student and everyone in between, their high-quality materials enable you to make your best work. To learn more, check them out at amico.com or on Instagram and Facebook at Amico Brent. You can also show them how you use Amico by sharing your work online with the hashtag HowIAmico. For the second half of today's episode, we're going to be listening to a 2014 panel discussion on trends in surface design that features Julia, as well as Michael Klein and Kristen Kiefer. If you're interested in listening to the full episode of this, it's no longer available on major podcast apps, but it will become available when it gets remastered as part of the Tales from the Vault podcast feed. If you're interested in listening to that, that is available on patreon.com slash redclayrambler. So let's jump into this conversation as Julia is talking about imagery. I think imagery is a bridge. I think it helps people enter into the work, and I think it's getting more and more prevalent because so much of what we look at is images online. And we look at images and narratives online all the time. And so that's become more of our common language. And that's why things like decals are so important now. Because the kind of newness of them is worn off, but still they're having some staying power. And I think people want to be able to make images without investing the kind of crazy amounts of time, you know, and decal can get you somewhere very quickly. 
So I know for me, I started to work with imagery on pots as a way of um, having my ideas more poignant and having my ideas be more underst- being understood more directly. And uh, there was somehow I was able to reach people through images on surfaces. People understood that they were more willing to go there with a handmade pot. Um, and I also found it more interesting for myself. I mean, I think a lot of those early Ebex pots or a lot of the really beautiful Japanese pots, are, they're so beautiful, but there's nothing about me that's the unknown craftsman at all. I wish it was, but it's just not. I'm too loud and obnoxious. And, you know, and so I had to find some other way of entering into the work because Sheena wasn't a way that I could enter. So I think developing specific imagery really helped with that. And I was thinking about sort of modernism and postmodernism when you guys were were talking, Um, because at different points in history, imagery has been extremely popular. Like I think about Italian Maelica and that ability to talk about a specific place and time for the culture itself. It wasn't necessarily like referencing some old past history. You know, like events were happening, they were depicting them on pots. And I think in some ways that's more the the direction that we're back in now. Mm-hmm. So do you guys think that that it was like the modernist impulse that erased that in terms of like architectural modernism and other bits of poo-pooing the ornament? You know, like people saying that ornamentation is negative and then the pottery community kind of following along that because I think there's a lot of Minge practitioners, so to speak, that actually do very modernist, minimalist decoration. So do you guys, how do you guys think that fits into it? Well, that was, when I was in school, it was postmodernism in the late eighties. It was all the, all the rage. And, uh, I didn't really have a skill of illustration or drawing per se. And I think what attracted me to printmaking in college still, um, drives me with <clears throat> my processes, my surface processes and the pots. And I did a lot of, you know, kind of, instead of using, um, uh, my skill to illustrate or, um, I would use patterns, letters and, and mix and match and cut and paste kind of things in printmaking. So I think I use that sort of in a way with pattern. Um, I do try to put a bird on it sometimes <laughs> or a fish or, you know, some kind of, uh, uh, in, uh, figure in the ground. But, um, I think that's my, um, background was from that 80s sort of postmodernism, borrowing, putting things together, um, especially with my forms. I think my forms and my patterns come from different cultures, you know, mm-hmm. and I think that's, it's interesting to me to put those things together and see how they contrast or compare. Modernism so strong, right? It still is really strong now. Modernism, like postmodernism was a blip on the modernist radar, mm-hmm. you know. I'm not sure how that fits in with decoration, but I know for myself that Decoration allowed me to get into work in a way that was easier to talk about and clearer. And especially being a teacher, um, you know, in the in college, talking about work all the time and having to sort of be able to explain work, that that did filter into my studio work. And so um, being able to talk about ideas in pots in a way that was narrative was uh, helps students make connections to their own work. And it helps students make their own ideas faster. Mm-hmm. They didn't have to quite quite go through like ABEX to get there at the end. So I think that that was really very powerful for the students to be able to find their own voice a little bit more quickly, uh, but it was through using imagery. And my sense is that, you know, since we purchase so much work online now that Surface really allows us to say if we like it or don't like it. And then when we use it is when we like love it or mm-hmm. don't love it. So I think that uh, Surface is sort of like a little come hither. Mm-hmm. And um, the clarity of that specific image really helps with that. You know, bicycle tires are big and bicycles are really big right now and cats and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, putting a coffee <laughs> cup on a coffee cup, you know, it still seems funny, I guess. But so I think that but there's something about that surface, which is very, very seductive. But I think in some ways it really serves us, right? So then the pot moves into somebody's life and then they start to use it and then form, I think, is what holds them over time, that that's what they fall in love with. Because yeah, I think form becomes part of your story, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. like how you use that pot and how you experience it while you're using it. That's very much about form. So then that's when it becomes part of your story. And mm-hmm. I think initially when you're sort of being seduced by surface, it's not quite part of your own story yet. You're still sort of reading the maker's story. And as we're talking, you know, you're talking about the Internet and how that's changed the way we see images in a pot that's going to be attractive online is not always the same pot that's going to be great in the home. 
But that doesn't mean that people can't be wildly successful selling those pots. And that's part of the whole notion of a trend, you know, is that you can have something that has a spike in interest that could be actually not that good in person, but the internet allows that spike in interest because it's, it's so visual that, you know, you buy lots and lots of them. And, and those trends tend to, I think, be very quick, you know, so you'll see, and, and I'm thinking outside of ceramics, but you'll see like some object that's like the hot Christmas gift, thousands of people buy it. And then the next year there's none left. Mm-hmm. You know, so how do you guys see trends develop? It's kind of a question about the internet, but it's kind of just about trends in general. Well, I think um, trends are about speed. I mean, trends are things that you learn quickly, and often they're based on new, uh, sort of new technologies, like 3D printing, kind of a rage right now. Mm. And uh, do you remember when Photoshop was a rage and it was like the worst stuff you've ever seen? You know, <laughs> and now it's just a common tool and it's much better looking. So I think trends are about speed and they're about ease, and they're not really rooted in um, skill development. I think skill comes, skills like on the other side of trend a little bit to me, you know, it seems like when all those Surik stains came out and suddenly we could get red and orange and yellow, woo, you know, so exciting. And then, you know, 10 years later, we, they don't even make them anymore. So I think there's something about technology or invention jumping over skill mm-hmm. is where a trend is. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and when people are able to have it combined with skill is when it has staying power, you know, when its interest is past the wow moment. Mm-hmm. You know, when um, content can really come in, that's when it's no longer a trend and more becomes sort of an area in our field. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, decals, perfect thing Mm -hmm. for a trend, Mm -hmm. like just perfect. And now some people are doing very, very interesting things with decals. Mm -hmm. Like now it's sort of surpassing. The wow factor is a little bit less. And, you know, we you can learn decals in Ceramics 1 now, you know, so it's sort of sort of a shift there. And I think as soon as it becomes more common like that, then it's kind of not a trend any longer. So that's my sense, because it's related to speed. I'd like to congratulate Julia for being named the Ceramic Artist of the Year. This award is well-deserved, as I think that she is one of the most significant artists of her generation. They did a great interview with her that is a part of the Ceramic Arts Yearbook and Annual Buyer's Guide, which is a supplement to Ceramics Monthly and Pottery Making Illustrated. You can find that on their website, which is ceramicartsnetwork.org. I did want to thank Amico for sponsoring today's episode. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor on the show, you can get in touch through the website. That's brickyardnetwork.org. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all indigenous communities whose lands we reside on in the United States and recognize that we are uninvited guests on the occupied, unceded, and ancestral lands of over 500 nations indigenous to North America. By acknowledging and reflecting upon the contemporary lived experiences and histories of the indigenous peoples here and globally, we may begin to take essential steps towards creating a more equitable world. Learn more through the hashtag Honor Native Land Initiative of the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture and consider contributing to Indigenous-led organizations doing important work to further health and wellness, sovereignty, and self-determination of the first people of the lands you reside. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.